and welcome to today's recording. Today we're going to be focusing on Agile integration. This will be an introduction for those who've not heard me talk on Agile integration before. Very much based around the material you find if you want to read on further in a red book that we wrote last year. Talking about how integration has changed over recent years, even decades, and how we're taking advantage of modern cloud native architecture containerization and the way that, that people and organizations are changing to accommodate that different kind of world. In a couple of weeks time we have a follow-on talk which is noting the same thing in a way but from a very different angle. We're going to look at it from an application developer's point of view because application developers are now getting more involved in performing integration themselves and so we're going to have a look at it from their perspective for those of you who have heard me talk about agile integration before there'll be a lot of new material in that section which is looking at it from a, a wholly new perspective but uh, this week's a good introduction to agile integration concepts as they stand my name is Kim Clark. I'm an integration architect and I've been working in this field for a good couple of decades now, um, implementing integration solutions with customers and working as an architect. And so I've seen the passage of time and how things have changed in the integration world and how we've moved from sort of point to point and hub and spoke architectures through service oriented architecture and the effect of microservices on that and, and all those sort of things. And they've come together really into what we're now focusing on as agile integration. The path to agile integration takes into account that kind of history of integration that we've had over the years. As I mentioned, there is a book that we wrote last year and the first Four chapters of that book are not specific to products or vendors. They're very much talking about these architectural concepts and, uh, and organizational uh, constructs and focusing on, on how people achieve modernization from an integration perspective using these agile integration techniques. And agile integration itself, it, it's got some sort of central themes and they're, they're based around different um, different ways of looking at the problem. So obviously there's an architectural element to this. This is very much a, a discussion around um, how we're going to build integration differently into a landscape. And you know we'll see some of these key things coming up like more fine-grained deployment or focusing on uh, API-led or event-driven ways of communicating between different components. But there's also a people and process aspect to it where we're seeing a more separated view of how people are working in organizations they're working much more autonomously in teams and so what does that mean for how we move people around and who who's actually performing the integration and then finally of course there is a technology aspect to it and of course you know I come from the background of our integration portfolio in IBM but in, in a way what's more important is what's happening underneath that portfolio in a way that we're moving to a more containerized and cloud native style of infrastructure and the benefits that that's giving us from a, an optimization point of view. So many different aspects going into that to enable us to perform integration in a way that's more effective than it would have been in the past. Let's pick off each one of those separately. So from a people and process point of view, where we, where we were in the past, and many companies still are, to be fair, and some for, for very good reason, is to have a central team of integration specialists who work on building the integrations for the organization. And they take on a funnel of requirements coming in from the business. And that could be coming in from people who own existing systems of record who want to expose them, or it could be the people innovating with the engagement applications who are asking for data from back-end systems or people asking how to join and synchronize data across systems. All of those requirements pouring in and more and more by the minute into that single team of specialists. It's pretty quick and easy to see that, that that's not going to scale, um, especially as integration becomes more and more important to organizations. There are many more different sources of data, many more uh, different SaaS applications being used, so software as a service applications, Internet of Things, events coming from there, all sorts of different places where we're getting information from. And so as we move across to the right hand side of the chart we see the possibility to move to domains owning their own integration, performing their own integration, owning what it is that they expose to another domain, 
owning how they consume things from other domains. And those people from the integration specialist team potentially moving down into those teams. Now, as we'll see as we go, uh, as we get towards the tail of it, that for most organizations, there will be a blend of what's happening on the left-hand side and what's happening on the right-hand side. Very few will shift completely to the right. It's unquestionable that, that microservices architecture has had a strong influence on the way that people are building applications in general. Um, being able to break an application up into smaller pieces, that sort of came at the same time, so around sort of 2014-15, as we were starting to see the maturing of te container technology, which we'll talk about in a minute. And so the ability to build things out of much smaller components that are completely self-contained offers us the ability to have greater agility, build things more quickly, to, to uh, make changes to things without them affecting other, other pieces of a system, scale things independently, so have a much more effective way of moving things around the infrastructure, and, and of course um, have resilience at a more discrete level, so at the level of an individual tiny component rather than a whole monolith um, being the thing that we're trying to make resilient. So we can have things resilient at a specific, uh, a specific level. And those benefits, those are benefits of microservices, but arguably they're, they're sort of, uh, they're, they're related to a number of other con concepts as well. The concepts of cloud native, the concepts of breaking things up by strong, strong boundaries with APIs and events, um, and of course containerization. So there's, a, there's a, a raft of different things happening architecturally that we can bring into the integration space and start doing there as well. And then I've mentioned containers a few times. Containers really do offer us a new way of, uh, of abstracting ourselves from infrastructure. And so they enable us to more, more declaratively describe what we want from infrastructure to say, you know, what kind of resilience and scalability we want, rather than having to go down and build it at the lowest level. We got some of that abstraction from virtual machines, um, and that was great that we allowed us to extract ourselves where possible from the hardware. Containers takes us a, a level further and allows us to get uh, a, a much greater benefit from that. And we're going to look at this from a number of the different angles that you see on this slide as we go through the presentation. So Agile integration itself, you can sum up a lot of the messages in this one slide, because this slide is showing a passage of time from left to right. On the left hand side, talking about having an organization that has probably tens or hundreds, or even in some cases, thousands of different systems of record holding their key data. So that's the, the, the light blue boxes towards the bottom. Joined together by integration, um, probably in the past that would have been files and message transfers in a very point-to-point -point way with code on both sides and then um, gradually moving towards exposing those things as services, uh, web services perhaps and exposing those to new applications that we're starting to use. So we start to see that more synchronous exposure as we came into service orientated architecture. Um, and they're still on that first, uh, first pillar effectively and maybe some of those we exposed outside of the organization to make uh, services easily used outside of the organization. The next step really from there, um, because there was uh, um, an element of that, that uh, um, governance and control and the things that we were exposing, we start to see a need to put a layer onto the front of those uh, exposure points. So API management became important. We moved uh, from exposing things as, as uh, web services to exposing them as APIs um, and started to, to use that as a, as a more common protocol, although web services are still certainly out there. Um, and exposing APIs outside the organization, perhaps even to join with the API economy, so to enable us to perhaps sell the type of capabilities that we've got as APIs, or at least increase our market share by allowing people to use the data from and the functions in our organization um, and, and get reach out to uh, people building new innovative applications. And so governing the way that we actually expose those things. And you'll notice also that the integration, we're starting to break that up a bit. So recognizing that just having one 
as I mentioned before, one team of people, of integration specialists, all working, sitting around potentially the same installation of uh, the, the actual integration capabilities, uh, is starting to create a bottleneck. So we start to uh, break those up into smaller pieces, probably one per domain within an organization, for example. And as we move to the third column, we start to see the influence of microservice architecture. So we start to see applications being built as small broken up pieces um, in, in individual components that can be changed, scaled and made more resilient in a more fine grained way. The natural conclusion to that is, well, maybe we could do that in the integration space too. Maybe we could now build integrations into individual containers that have maybe one integration or maybe just a small handful of integrations in each container still exposed through a, uh, an indirection layer of the API gateway and the API management facility. So there's n the, the people using those APIs have no idea that we've broken them up into smaller pieces, um, but it, it's, it, it's allowing us to be more agile, scalable and resilient uh, in, in, in the integration space. And then moving on to the, the third and final column, we can see that now that we've broken those integrations into smaller pieces, we start to recognize the fact that customers, most customers I speak to, are expecting to or are even already in a multi-cloud strategy. So they not only have things on-premise, but they have things in the cloud and perhaps in multiple different vendors of cloud. And even within one vendor, they might have multiple different regions and, and installations and so on. And so moving across those different domains, we start to see a shift from the very layered architectures that we see on the left-hand side to finally moving to this more componentized uh, uh, architecture that we see on the right, where people are sort of encapsulating each individual business component uh, with its own integration. So um, the team responsible for looking after a given system of record potentially take on the ways that you interact with that through APIs. Um, they take on the, the integrations that belong to that domain. And so that's a shift more in ownership than in technology, really. We'd already broken things into smaller pieces. Could we then have them assigned to more business-focused components? And you could argue that this was the goal of, you know, going back as far as you can remember, whether it was SOA or even object-orientated programming, to get towards this more componentized view of the world um, and that's something that we're able to do more and more today than we've been able to do in the past because the technology is starting to reach that, uh, that point where we can really separate these things uh, and govern them separately. Now, I think it's fair to say that most organizations are, are probably um, somewhere between uh, stage one and two here. Um, some organizations are exploring um, containerization in applications and, and latterly in integrations. Very few organizations are uh, certainly wholeheartedly at the column four, um, but some are certainly moving in that direction. And I think what we'll see is, is customers reaching a blend of column three and column four over the next few years. So this is very much a future looking objective, um, not necessarily where customers are, are today. So let's just drop down into these benefits of, uh, of the cont container-based strategy and apply that to some of the technologies that we've mentioned so far. And we'll gradually work our way around the whole integration portfolio, if you like, from, from application integration, through the API management aspects, through to messaging and events. And if we just take a look, first of all, at what we really mean by containers bringing to us fine-grained resilience, how does that enable us to create components that are more uniquely changeable uh, and can be handled from a resilience point of view, can be started and stopped more quickly, um, can be uh, have a, a sort of an implicit, highly available capability. So let's imagine breaking up, and, and you know, this picture would be the same if we we're talking about applications or integrations, but I'm talking about integration. Um, we would have had an enterprise service bus perhaps with many, many uh, hundreds of integrations. It's not unusual uh, for, for large companies. And breaking those up first of all into the business domains that they relate to so that they can be administered separately. 
and then within that perhaps down to individual containers with individual integrations and now we can really make changes separately and let's have a think about what we can do here we really can go down to the level of um, changing for example the runtime that we're using and the fixed pack level that we're using of the integration runtime for a particular set of integrations so we could say, you know, I want that new feature or, uh, that, that, that we brought out in, in fixed pack 10 of, of the particular runtime. Uh, I want that capability for this new integration, but I don't want to have to wait until the whole ESB structure is brought up to speed on that uh, fixed pack. I'm going to bring that in just for my integration. And so we can do things at that level, and also we can scale at that level, as I'll come on to in a moment. Um, but we can also create this kind of resilience too. I can, I can say, well, I actually have a particular integration here um, that I want to make sure has, uh, has uh, many copies of it running. So if I get any uh, outages, then they're barely noticed because I've got, say, four or five or, or 10 or 11 of these running. Uh, and so I can spread the load much more effectively uh, across different domains and, and different capabilities. So, so being able to perform that, that kind of resilience is very important. Let's have a look at that scalability then. So from, a, um, uh, from a, a scalability point of view and being able to balance workload, we really want the container orchestration platform to take on that job for us. If we have a look at how we used to do that in the past. In the past, we used to have to build a highly available infrastructure and if we wanted to scale that out we'd have to introduce new servers in a pretty manual fashion and the whole build out of that infrastructure was was very proprietary to an individual product you had to know a lot about that product you had to use a lot of uh, proprietary perhaps command lines and scripts and things like that in order to do that We've shifted across to a completely different way of looking at that as we move to a more cloud native uh, approach. We give an orchestration platform like Kubernetes, we give it a container image and the container image has not just the runtime for integrations but also the actual integration definition itself embedded in the container image. And then we just say to Kubernetes, treat this as a black box. I will tell you what characteristics I want generically. I'll say I want you to have a certain number of these running at any given time. I want you to spread them across availability zones um, and balance the workload across them evenly and then leave Kubernetes to do that job for you. And so then we end up with a more declarative, generic way of describing what we want from the infrastructure and we let the container platform deal with it for us. Very little is done at the proprietary level. Most of that is contained within the image and the image is built by just placing things on the file system. So we've changed our products, for example, so that you can install them. They are just laid on the file system as an installation. You lay a set of properties files on the, on, on the, the file system. And then finally, uh, you lay the code, if you like, the integration code onto the file system. And then you start the image and you have a running integration. So there's very little that's happening in there which you need, you need special skills for or even knowledge of, of command lines and things. And that moves us into a, a different place um, where you know, a, a generic administration and orchestration system like uh, Kubernetes can take on uh, that uh, kind of, of, uh, of looking after those containers. So, for example, we could have completely different uh, scalability requirements on the individual containers. So one set of integrations might have um, a, a very simple resilience requirement, just like the HA that we had before. So the minimum and maximum of, of, of one or two that you want to keep running at any given time. But we could have others that can scale from one up to nine to, to enable them to really slim down when they're not, we're not needing as much CPU. We could have others where we have a minimum, where we say a, a minimum of three that we want to keep running for availability reasons to make sure that it's always high availability. So we can really tune each individual integration to respect the characteristics that we need from a business, business point of view. Now there's another big benefit that's coming from moving to this um, common orchestration platform for containers sitting underneath all of this. 
And that's the fact that we reduce the skill set that you need. So at the moment, we've mostly talked about what would be an integration runtime like IBM Integration Bus, if you're still on version 9 or 10. Uh, version 11, you'll be on AppConnect Enterprise. It's the same product, but we've given it a different uh, name. So, you know, we've been mostly talking about how you would build out those pieces. But what about if you also need to deploy um, messaging like MQ, or you need to deploy Kafka? So we have IBM event streams, or if you need to deploy an API management solution. What if you could use the same skill sets to be able to deploy and maintain those as well? And that's really what containers is bringing to the party. No longer do you have to understand how to de deploy individual resources, how to set up the routing between the proxies and the, the load balancers and the, the individual pieces, how to handle things operationally at runtime. Really, the only thing you need to learn how to work with is the individual artifacts. So what is the integration that I've built? Or what is the API that I'm exposing? Or what is the queue that I'm placing onto a queue manager? Those are the things that you need to know how to do. But the rest of it is standard Kubernetes. And we've, of course, added a, a layer on top of that to give you added functionality with what we provide in OpenShift. So relationship with Red Hat is very, very important here because it allows us to bring even more things to the party to enable you to do uh, administration of things in a very consistent way. So building out those individual artifacts is the main thing you need to learn. Everything else becomes what will be a very commonly known skill set. Admittedly, people are only just getting to learn Kubernetes, but it, is, it seems pretty clear that going forward, that's going to be a core skill set for most people in the workforce. Agility, of course, is a, is a really important thing to us uh, as well. So agility and kind of team productivity that you see at the top here are both very closely related. Being able to set up a build pipeline, for example, so that when you make a change and you, you push that change perhaps into GitHub, um, that can ripple through all the way through into production. Now that might be a change to an integration that you've made, it might be a change to the way that you've exposed an API, it might be a change to the configuration of a queue, but it could also be, be changes to the infrastructure. It could be a change perhaps in fixed pack level of, of the pieces that you want to use for the runtime. And those things could be pushed through in what we call GitOps. So you effectively have declarative push through of maybe the uh, resilience settings of how many replicas you want of the particular integration. All of those things can be uh, pushed through in an automated pipeline in a much easier way if you're dealing with containers because the way you set up the overall CICD pipeline is very different. So let's have a, a quick look at that uh, concept. So pipeline automation is really critical if you're going to get to a level of agility where you really can start to push changes through with some level of trust. And you know anybody working with the sort of concepts of microservices will know how important this is because there's no point in saying you know that, that you have an independent component as a microservice unless you can actually push new changes through with confidence. And that means having a good build automation capability, which means, as I mentioned already, being able to simplify the way that we perform builds so that builds are really more a case of laying things on file systems and, and, and creating something as an image. The uh, testing, so automated testing, we're pushing more and more effort into making automated testing a fundamental part of the suite as well because it's, it's something that without that you really can't allow things to automatically go through into any environment, never mind production, unless you can have confidence in those tests. And then being able to deliver to different environments in exactly the same way. So instead of the executable being something that's just perhaps related to the individual runtime, it's actually now the whole environment. Effectively, you can say uh, the container image contains absolutely everything that's needed to deploy something on a raw Kubernetes environment. So it's effectively, each time you deploy an integration, even if it's just a change to an integration, you're effectively redeploying a brand new environment with all of the things that matter. And it looks exactly the same as it did in your test environment. And it's a specific individual integration that you're pushing out there. And that makes it much more straightforward from an operational point of view to, for it to be looked after. It's just a black box that comes with all of its dependencies and you can administer it just like any other container in Kubernetes.
So looking at this from a different perspective now then, so mostly we've been looking there at how we're breaking up the integration layer uh, into smaller pieces, but sitting on top of that was API management. And API management becomes increasingly important as we're changing the implementation of the integrations underneath, because we don't want to make it visible to anybody consuming these APIs how we've built the integrations. We want that aspect of it to be invisible. So we want to be able to break things up into smaller pieces. And indeed, we want to be able to control who has access to each individual integration. We want them to be able to discover it for themselves. And uh, we want to be able to revoke access and things as well, if you we want to. So that's really what API management's job is. And we can see very clearly here the separation between these two of exposure, which is what API management is trying to achieve, it's allowing us to do the routing and the versioning to the various integrations that are sitting underneath. And then perhaps uh, um, more relevantly is, is the socialization. This is the thing that allows us to you know, automatically push a new API or changes to an API to a portal that people can come and discover from, whether they're internal consumers or whether they're external consumers enable them to find the APIs that they need in order to build their application, subscribe to them so that we know who's using them and we can give them a particular priority of service. They can perhaps use different levels of service in order to gain different levels of throughput, for example, and we can control whether they're allowed to have that, um, perhaps because they're paying us more money or maybe because they have arranged different contractual requirements with us. All of that should have nothing to do with the integration itself. The integration is simply designed to scale. So if we look at what the implementation of the integration is on the bottom here, that's busy performing the deep connectivity to any difficult protocols and data formats we might find on backend systems. Um, we've got you know 20 years of, of digging into backend systems and being able to talk all those difficult protocols. That still needs to happen for many systems. Yes, new systems may be exposing things as APIs already, but older systems don't. So we need to be able to dig through to those protocols and then compose requests across multiple invocations, maybe to the same system, maybe even to multiple different systems, that composition is part of what the integration layer is achieving as well. We don't want that composition or indeed that adaptation up in the gateway layer, the API management layer. That has to be a highly secure, governed and controlled layer. So we keep those two pieces separate, integration, performing the composition and adaptation, and API management doing the outward facing, the upward facing consumer focused aspect of it. So downward focused integration, upward focused exposure. And we achieve that, of course, by having the runtime component that intercepts every request coming through is the API gateway. We have, of course, data power for that, um, IBM data power, which is uh, you know, a, a, a renowned gateway for securing uh, back-end systems, uh, especially you know, it came in during the period when XML was a popular uh, wire format. It also covers uh, JSON as well, and, and it's, it's specifically designed for the kind of threats that you're trying to deal with there. But we add a layer on top of that, allowing us to check the, the kind of security requirements that we're going to need for APIs specifically. So how do I check um, that the right people are making requests, so only certain subscribers can make a certain number of requests per second, um, certain types of security model. I can define all of that policy in the API manager. So the API manager is a user interface for the people who are exposing APIs. And we're back again to this idea of it being more decentralized. So the API manager can be used by an application team or by an integration team to expose their own APIs. They don't have to go to a data power expert to expose things on an API gateway. They simply go to the API manager and administer in a, straight, a more straightforward user interface what the definition of their APIs looks like. Those can be automatically pushed up to a developer portal then, which is exposed outwardly across the enterprise or even beyond the enterprise to allow people to self-subscribe. So they don't have to come to a team and say, can I use your APIs? They can simply discover them and subscribe to them themselves. And both parties can look at analytics on what APIs they're using, the frequency of their use, and so on. 
uh, whether that's to enable us to monetize it or just simply to get some idea of, of which APIs are popular and how they're being used. So all sorts of really valuable information we can gain from that. So that's really what API management's about, much more than just the gateway. Um, it's actually performing uh, roles to enable this decentralization to other teams as well. And API management has a fundamental role to play as we move forward into this much more complex environment with many more components, lots of different microservices, for example, um, sitting out there uh, in our uh, environments. Really, they create the shell, the, the, the shell that sits around that application boundary, collecting a set of microservices together and saying, here, here are the only APIs you can call to get inside and use this functionality to use this data. And so they create the boundaries that make the whole environment look more understandable. If we just had thousands of microservices spread across our environment, it would be very difficult to understand what was interacting with what. It's this sort of a layer of boundaries that we see, this grouping that they can, we can create by using API management in combination with the underlying platform. So we need to make use of what Kubernetes can give us in terms of isolating network areas. And indeed, OpenShift brings more to the table in this area to allow us to, to secure a set of services um, separately from, from uh, one group from another, so that the only way in and out is through the uh, controlled routes through API management. We need to also respect that new types of interface are coming along, and API management has a role to play here too. So GraphQL has become popular in recent years. REST APIs can end up being quite chatty, especially when you're trying to draw back information across a complex data model. GraphQL enables you to draw back um, elements from a graph of data and only the elements that you want, right down to the individual fields that you're choosing to draw back in your query. And so, you know, it, it, you know for those of us with, with a bit of history, obviously we recognize these concepts from right back from SQL and things before that as well. So this sort of idea of being able to specify exactly what you want. Now, GraphQL is still in its, its in fairly young years at the moment, and we're starting to see it used in many different places in the architecture. Um, it could be used, for example, to um, expose things on that sort of enterprise service bus, uh, whether it's broken up in the style of agile integration or whether it's one big service bus. That reusable enterprise layer, that's number one. Number two is where we're exposing things externally, that, that external exposure, and uh, exposing things outside the enterprise to allow people to reuse them. Um, of course, back-end systems may start to expose GraphQL uh, APIs. That might be a more appropriate uh, route for them to provide flexibility. And we can see up at number four, between a user interface and a back-end for front-end. So if I'm writing a new single-page web application or a mobile application, I'll nearly always need a, a dedicated back-end for front-end application sitting behind that. And if I could make the interface between those two as flexible as possible so I don't have to keep changing the interface and make it uh, reduce the chattiness of that interface, that would be very powerful. So we're starting to see GraphQL used there as well. And finally, databases themselves are considering whether they are appropriate to expose GraphQL as an interface style. Now, in not every case would it be appropriate to use API management, but we would see at the moment the likely places where we would use API management would be one and two. And it essentially comes down to wherever we're doing fairly reusable um, capabilities. We want the opportunity of controlling multiple consumers. We want the opportunity to uh, look after the different consumers that are coming through. So that's you know essentially the, the, the place where we would expect to see API management. And we've been building in uh, GraphQL capabilities into our API Connect product uh, to enable us to do more sophisticated controls. So GraphQL, um, because it's bringing back a data graph, essentially has a, a very different attack surface for security problems and performance problems. And so we, we're starting to build in some clever algorithms so we can look at the depth of the request, how many recursive depths and, and the, the style of the request to see if it's likely to have an adverse effect on downstream systems, which is a much more complex thing to do than, than what we're necessarily doing for simple web services and REST APIs. So some sophistication in the API management layer that's specific to GraphQL is certainly essential.
And then we can move across to something that we've not really mentioned so far. So we've sort of looked mostly at synchronous communication across all of these different pieces. And we can kind of assume now that HTTP is just there. You know, we just, we're so used to having the internet out there and IP communication as, as a fundamental mechanism that we forget that not all communication goes across synchronous requests. And so not everything is going over HTTP. And huge parts of, of, of major organizations use messaging as a backbone, even though there's also you know, HTTP traffic as well. MQ is, is sort of you know, fundamental to uh, the finance industry, uh, in payments and things like that, securely moving things around behind the scenes. And, and that continues to happen as we move to multi-cloud, as we start to see uh, organizations spreading across different cloud platforms. They've got their traditional on-premise. They've got perhaps a private cloud environment that sits in their own data centers but looks more like a cloud. Getting information across between these different systems, yes, you can use HTTP when that's appropriate. Um, but there will also be times when you want to move things around in, in a more asynchronous fashion. Now, of course, messaging is what's been around for several decades now, and we're used to that idea of very secure uh, MQ-like traffic where we can guarantee that if we put a message somewhere locally, the channels underneath in MQ will just find a way to bring that securely and, and transactionally to another platform and deliver it to the application concerned. And MQ continues to serve that purpose. But we're also starting to see a desire for um, a subtly different form of asynchronous communication, uh, which is events. And that is also allowing us to move data around in an asynchronous fashion, but with a different objective. And I'll come on to that in a moment. Let's just take a look, first of all, at you know, how we expect the landscape to change, this communication between, say, a microservice application that needs data from outside its own environment. I mean, you're never going to have all the data you need in the microservice application. We're building new innovations. They're bound to be drawing information from lots of places. We could call APIs, and we will, in many cases, call APIs to get to that information. I'm showing on the screen here, talking to our systems of record. Of course, you'd probably be talking to external APIs as well. But the danger with that is that the API assumes it's a synchronous call, and it's, it's synchronously calling the back-end system. And so it assumes that that back-end system is there, that it's available for the same characteristics that the microservice requires, and that it has the performance capabilities to cope with the extra requests that are coming through. But a lot of the backend systems we're talking to don't have that capability. And so the idea that we could bring events to the surface from those backend systems and feed those up into the microservices is an alternative to APIs. And you can imagine straight away that it's very useful for things where we want to be notified of something happening in real time. We could have events delivered up to the microservices so that we know what's going on. But actually, people are starting to use that in more fundamental ways as well. And they're starting to actually listen to those streams of events and build caches or what we call projections of data up in the microservice applications as well. And event streams are not just in use between older systems of record and new microservice applications. They're popular within the microservice applications too. And that's something we'll talk a lot more about in the, the second presentation uh, in terms of how they're used inside an application. But we can see going into the future that there'll be a balancing act between when to use APIs with perhaps a simpler programming model um, and uh, less sort of design ramifications or events where we can potentially create new, new layers of, of uh, resilience and perhaps improve our agility and so on. And so I've kind of loosely mentioned messaging in the style of, of um, MQ and the, the, the sort of traditional messaging compared to events. And by events, I was talking primarily about Kafka. That seems to become one of the most popular ones on the market today. So we also have IBM event streams, which we, we see as a, a complementary to um, MQ. So we have this, these two different styles of asynchronous communication. There's things that each of them do individually that are, that are unique to them. So the assured delivery is something you'd immediately relate to traditional messaging. Whereas if you're looking at exceedingly scalable subscription, or if you're very interested in the history of events, because Kafka holds 
all of the historical events, whereas NQ would delete them as they're read, um, then you know you're looking at a very different style of of knee, a very different requirement uh, that Kafka may be more uh, suited to. Again, much more discussion on that topic in uh, the, the the following presentation. Um, but you know we don't see these as competing; we see these as complementary capabilities, and sometimes even combined together. So taking a, a broader look then, when we look across landscapes, where do we expect people to land in the future? It isn't a reality that people are going to wholeheartedly move completely across to decentralized IT with every application team taking on its own in integration um, and everything moving into the cloud and, and you know, uh, 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 shifting from old mainframe systems of record entirely into to software as a service. It's, you know, it will be a blend and the bigger the organization, the more complex that blend will be. And so we're going to see, um, if you remember back to the four part diagram we started with at the beginning, a good scenario would be if companies could get to column three and four and a combination thereof. So some of the centralized aspects, but done in a more fine grained way, and, and then some more decentralized where appropriate for the given teams that need that kind of agility and perhaps are more focused on building microservices style applications. And we also see the iPads, so the, the, the blue cloud in the middle there, where you have perhaps a managed service for integration, uh, which enables a whole different class of users into the fray. So somebody who's significantly perhaps less technical, still with a technical mindset, but not you know, having to be somebody who's a programmer, uh, an application developer, or somebody who's an integration specialist, somebody who perhaps is coming to this from, from a, a different perspective and allowing them to, to be able to achieve this as well. So we've moved across to, as I say, this blend. We expect to see it as more of a blend as we go through. In terms of uh, our portfolio, we have the IBM Cloud Pack for integration, and everything I've mentioned so far lives within this. So, you know, for listing from the top to the bottom there, that's API Connect, App Connect Enterprise, uh, IBM MQ, IBM Event Streams. We haven't talked about Aspera yet, but that provides the high speed data transfer and, of course, the integration security that we get from the raw data power that's actually part of API Connect from the top anyway. And these are all able to be deployed where you have them today. You can still continue under the Cloud Pack for Integration license to deploy them where you have them today, but you could also choose to move them to containers. And we have made them cloud ready so that they can maximize containers and they can maximize Kubernetes, and they can maximize indeed OpenShift as a platform. Um, and in future weeks, we'll do some much deeper dives into our technology and into how they sit on top of, of OpenShift and those container platforms as well. But that broad set of you know powerful capabilities that you know you've known about for for a long time now, all have a cloud native facet to them where they they work seamlessly in a, in a container based cloud native environment. It's worth just mentioning a customer here just to give you some idea of of how people are making use of agile integration. This is a a, a large UK based retailer uh, with a global presence. For them, they had this exact problem we're talking about of um, centralized infrastructure. It wasn't just about how fast they could build integrations. It was also about how fast they could build new infrastructure that could take weeks or months to get things like you know new queue managers built and things like that. And a lot of that was down to, to the challenges of process and the way that things had to be provisioned. And so they needed to look at ways to move to a more cloud native style and, and work their way across to a way of, of deploying things that was uh, that you know, used a different skill set and used the technology in a more effective way, allowed them to provision things in the way that cloud native software wants to be able to do it. You give it a declarative uh, description of how you want it to scale up and grow, and then it will do it for you. And so using these techniques we've been talking about, um, using our, our Cloud Pack for integration, they moved to being able to provision much more rapidly. I mean, to the point where they were getting uh, new, newly provisioned infrastructure out in minutes rather than a small number of minutes, in fact, rather than you know, weeks and months, because they'd focused over some time 
And this is not just a technology conversation. Of course it isn't. This is about you know changing the way that they worked as well and working through all of the, the ways that they could pattern the infra patternize these infrastructures and finally get to a point where they could provision within a very short space of time. Um, really proud to work with this customer. They, they really championed the concepts behind in Agile integration and we work, walked on this journey together um, as we were improving the products on one side and they were improving their, their processes and mechanisms as well. Evergreening, allowing them to adopt integration software as it came out. We push out a new fix pack. They have that fix pack in production as soon as they want it to be there, essentially. It could be, it could be immediate if they want it to. Productivity, so they can now introduce, recognizing that they had only a small set of patterns they were doing for integration, they're able to patternize those. And so um, and now enabling teams that perhaps otherwise wouldn't have been able to build their own integrations um, to, to do that. And a much more fine-grained control from a resilience point of view, um, building out these truly decoupled uh, pieces. Uh, and they started to make use of the event streams techniques that we're talking about as well, starting to have streams of events to complement their API uh, capabilities. They're very much a hybrid connectivity at the moment. They're moving to the cloud, but for a long time they're still going to have on-premise needs too. And so they've got a mixture of things running in uh, mainframes and, and um, uh, virtual machines as well as in the cloud. So the whole set moving together. So that gives you some idea of what Agile integration brings to the table. Uh, it's a journey, it's a journey, and uh, uh, there's various stages to it. We run uh, integration modernization workshops, um, so that's something we offer to customers um, for, as an exercise. Depending on the scale of it, it could be a free exercise for you. Um, and, uh, and allow us to uh, walk through where you are on that journey and find out what steps would be best for you to take next and what your real target is. Your target might not be to move to a completely decentralized architecture, so work out what the relevant target is for you. And trying to bring the kind of benefits that I was describing from that, that retail customer in terms of a more productive workforce, being able to deliver things more effectively, um, getting more robust at the individual granule level and of course as everybody needs to becoming more efficient both from from a you know energy consumption point of view and from a from a cost point of view of course as well and just generally being able to to run more effectively so with that um, we've got some links here to to help you to get started with agile integration in general and if you want to look into the cloud pack for integration um, but that uh, hopefully gives you some insight into what uh, our intention is be behind Agile integration. That's a term we're seeing used across the industry. It's not just an IBM term. It's a, it's a broader term than that. And uh, you know, we, we see most, most companies talking about it in the same way, moving to a more uh, cloud-native and, and largely containerized way of uh, achieving integration.